Hi guys, I'm CRH Krishnan from uh, Hyderabad. I'm in practice. So in this video, we're going to see standard number 210, which is on agreeing the terms of audit engagement. Right, uh, this standard is both at final level and at uh, IPCC level, a very important standard. So let me put you with some interesting facts of standard number 210. What is standard number 210 all about? It is the fundamental and the very basic step which we start with, right? Which is called what? The engagement of the auditor, which is the first step in the entire audit process. Now, when we talk about engagement of the auditor, what comes to our mind or what is the starting of the audit? So, what are the basic objectives of why you do standard number 210? See, at the very beginning of an audit, we always have a doubt. Should we really take up this audit? Right? Should we not really take up this audit? Because this is always a confusion. So, standard number 210 is in here to clear that confusion, which has two preconditions. What are the two preconditions which you need to ensure before you take up the audit engagement? So let's straight away get to five parts of the standard. I'm dealing part one of the standard to understand what are the preconditions to the audit. And as I said, how many preconditions are there? There are two preconditions to the audit. First one is talking about use of an acceptable financial reporting framework. Your client, if he is using an acceptable financial reporting framework, that's your first point. Only then you can take up the audit engagement. See, right away, if you, I mean, if your client is not using any kind of an acceptable FRM, there is no point in you taking up the audit and doing something, right? Then, you also know that it is the responsibility of the management to prepare and present the financial statements and provide us with all the information along with setting up of internal controls. But, 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 before we take up the audit engagement, it is to be written and given by the management that they acknowledge their responsibilities. So to wind up on this particular point, we have two preconditions. One talking about the precondition number one, which is about acceptable use of a financial reporting framework. And two, it is about the management acknowledging their responsibilities. Now the question builds up further. What are the three responsibilities of management? One is to prepare and present financial statements. Two, it is to design and implement internal controls. And three, is that they need to provide the auditor with and then you have three sub points in that which is about what all information additional information and unrestricted access to all those people in the entity from whom the auditor determines that it is supposed to be obtaining for the audit evidence so once again let me wind up on this particular point which says what the two preconditions one is about use of acceptable forf and two it is about the management acknowledging its responsibilities three responsibilities on preparation and presentation of financial statements, design and implementation of internal controls, and to provide the auditor with respective information. If at this point in time we know that both the preconditions are present, then the auditor will take up the audit. The auditor will take up the audit. If not, now I'm going to introduce you to two situations again where the management has imposed certain limitations on you even before you take up the engagement focus on this word called prior what is prior that is even before you take up the audit engagement so if there are limitations which are imposed by the management prior to you taking up the audit engagement what's the best solution don't even take up the audit engagement on point number two if the preconditions are not present and i hope you just understood the two preconditions if the preconditions are not present the same reply do not take up the audit engagement so guys, there are two cases where you will not be taking up the audit engagement, which means if there are limitations prior to the audit or if the preconditions are not present, in both these cases, you are not going to take up a audit engagement. All right, if both these conditions are not there and then you would like to take up the audit engagement, what is the next step? All right, the next step is about preparing a audit engagement letter. What is the audit engagement letter and what are its contents? A possible question in any exam, right? What are the six contents of the audit engagement letter, right? What do we do here? Start with the objective. Why are you doing the audit? We all know that we are doing the audit to express an opinion on the true and fair view of the financial statements. So picking up on that point, let's start writing up the engagement letter. So it is the duty of the auditor to pick up a blank sheet and start writing the engagement letter. Let's see what contents does he put in. As per standard number 210, you have six contents. What are the six contents that go into the engagement letter? One, objective of the audit. Two, scope of the audit. 
Three is what is your responsibility as an auditor? And four, what is their responsibility as management? Once you're very clear about these four response, I mean, these four points and explaining both the responsibilities very clearly, it's very, very important to write down the engagement letter. What is the applicable financial reporting framework? Now hold on this point because I just told you some time back something called acceptable FRF. Now I'm talking about an applicable FRF. Now watch out. Acceptable FRF is something where you use it to prepare a set of financial statements. While which could be even as simple as a T-shaped balance sheet format. But when you talk about an applicable financial reporting framework, you've got to go back to the laws and regulations to find out what exactly is applicable to you. Now, like I say, for example, in case of a company, Schedule 3 of the Companies Act 2013 says, I am giving you the format of preparing by pre and the balance sheet. So you've got to prepare your financial statements only in Schedule 3 format if you're a company. Moving on, if you're a banking company, there is Banking Regulation Act. And if you're an insurance company, there is the IRDA, which is telling you in what formats you're supposed to prepare. So these are exclusive applicable FRS. And this is something that has to go into the particular engagement letter. So I think we've covered five, five points there. Objective, scope, responsibility of the management, responsibility of the auditor, and applicable FRF. And what's more important to close out the audit is on the expected form and content of the audit report. Expected form and content of the audit report. That's the last point that we put up in the engagement letter. Now, once these six points have gone into the engagement letter, the auditor finishes the engagement letter, signs it across, and sends it to the management for their acknowledgement. On the other side, once the management receives the engagement letter from the auditor, they go through it and if all the terms are okay with them, they sign and acknowledge the terms of audit engagement and send back. Clarity point number one, auditor is the one who prepares the engagement letter, not management. A lot of people in the past have a misconception that the management doesn't know. The engagement letter is always prepared by the auditor, it is only acknowledged by the management. So that's branch number two of the standard, which talks about the contents of the engagement letter. We covered two parts to the standard. One, the preconditions to the audit, and two, the contents of the engagement letter. Now the bigger question at this point in time in the standard is, should we do this every recurring audit? Right, what's the answer? Again, two answers. You would do it in a recurring audit only under two circumstances. Because in every recurring audit, because you already done the audit last year, there is no point in writing the same engagement letter every year and sending it across. Therefore, in a recurring audit, when do you send the engagement letters? Only in two instances. Instance number one, when you need to remind the entity of the terms of engagement. For example, there is a change in management or the last time who acknowledged your engagement letter, that particular person in the management has resigned. He is not there anymore with the organization. There is a new CEO, change in management. These are all instances indicating that you should remind the entity that there needs to be a new engagement letter once again sent and just to remind. Don't even change the terms. Just send them so that you can remind them that those are the existing terms. So reason number one, when will you send an engagement letter in a recurring audit is only when there is a need for you to remind the entity of the existing terms. Moving up next is point number two when there are changes in terms of the audit engagement. No doubt, when there are changes in the audit engagement, we have to definitely prepare a new engagement letter and again get it acknowledged by the management. So though it is a recurring audit, but if the terms have changed, there is, then the old engagement letter stands absolutely invalid. So again, prepare a new engagement letter, get it acknowledged by the management. So guys, what are the two instances in which we will send a recurring audit, I mean send an engagement letter in the recurring audit? One is about when you need to remind the entity and two is when there are changes in terms of audit engagement. Now, one more important point in the standard at this point in time is, should I write the contents of the engagement letter every time, even when I'm guided by a particular act? One of the very important points that gives you clarity at this point in time is, if law or regulation exclusively prescribes in sufficient detail, so, the law or regulation has sufficiently spoken about what is the scope, objective, responsibility of management and responsibility of auditor very clearly. Then you need not record the same again. Obviously, what is the point? Will you keep the company's act in copy? There's no point. If the company's act has mentioned everything, then there's no need why you have to do it again in the engagement letter. So what does stand number 210 talk about this particular point? If law or regulation 
exclusively in sufficient detail prescribes the entire terms of an audit engagement, then you need not record the same in the engagement letter except that you state the fact that such law or regulation is applicable. So when you look at the wordings of the standard, it says state the fact. So you will not say that I'm going to perform the audit under these terms and write on the entire thing again as given in the act. So you will simply say when we do the audit, we will follow this particular act. I hope that point is very clear. It's a very attentive point. So we covered three parts to the standard. One on precondition, two on the contents of the engagement letter, three, do you have to send an engagement letter every recurring audit? All right, moving on to branch number four of this particular standard, which talks about acceptance and change in the terms of audit engagement. Do you have to accept the changes in terms of an audit engagement every time? All right, the answer is very simple. You will accept the changes in terms of audit engagement only if there is a reasonable justification from the management. If you don't have a reasonable justification from the management, do not accept the change in terms because the management are changing terms which might increase your audit risk, then don't do that, right? So all the two points that we're talking about, change in terms of audit engagement, if there's a reasonable justification, we would go with it. If there's no reasonable justification, you're not doing it. All right, so this is a very critical point. It's like a trap to the auditor. What's the trap? The management is not letting you continue the old terms. The management is not letting you continue the old terms. But at the same time, you don't want to perform the new terms because that is conveying a lower level of assurance. So what do we do, right? The final option at this point in time, when management is not okay, you doing the old terms and you not being okay doing the new terms is when you can withdraw from the engagement. Now at this point in time, I would like to remind you that we saw if limitations were known prior, we anyway haven't have accepted the engagement. But now that we know this now, there's no option that we can do that. So therefore, we will withdraw from the engagement and see who we can inform about this. Right? So that's part four to the standard. What is it talking about? If there's a reasonable justification, go for it. If there's no reasonable justification, do not change. And at the same time, if they're forcing you to do it, you can withdraw from the audit engagement. And you also need to remind, if there was a reasonable justification and you are changing the terms of audit engagement, it is important that the auditor now writes a new engagement letter with the revised terms and get it again acknowledged by the management. And I hope I'm clear with this particular point we're talking about reasonable justification and no reasonable justification. So that is part four of the standard, right? And moving on to part five, before I go to part five, we saw preconditions, we saw contents of the engagement letter, three, we saw recurring audit points, and four, we just saw when can we change the terms of audit engagement. Aspect number five in the standard are the two additional considerations that you see. What are the two additional considerations? Additional consideration number one, where there's a conflict between FR standards and law. Two is where there's a conflict between standards and auditing and law. All right, let's deal both this. Case number one, where there is a conflict between FR standards and law. Now, when I say FR standards, the financial reporting standards. Now, whose duty is to follow financial reporting standards? It is of the management, right? The management has to follow financial reporting standards. But if at all, the management is not following them because there is a law or regulation which is supplemented, then the law is the most superior thing in the country. So you got to follow law. But, but, but at this point in time, again, there is a possibility that the user may get confused because of this. So therefore, what is that they're supposed to do? At this point, what is that they're supposed to do? There is nothing but give an additional disclosure in the notes to account saying that they haven't followed the particular FR standard, but they have followed law. But if you still believe that won't clear, do not mention anywhere in the notes to accounts that financial statements have been prepared in accordance with any FRF. Do not mention about any standards. Just say that the financial statements have been prepared in accordance with the particular law. All right, moving on the other side is about another critical case where we're talking about FRs, I mean, the auditing standards being supplemented by law. Now, generally the auditing standards give you the format of reporting and the content. But if at all there is any law which supersedes this, you have no option but to follow law. But now the auditor is under a fix. What is the fix? He can't mention in the audit report that he had followed standards. So what's the next best thing that he can do? 
see whether anywhere in the audit report you can insert a paragraph to mitigate the possibility of misunderstanding of the users. So when the users read your report, they should not misunderstand your report. That's the idea, right? So mitigate the possibility of misunderstanding. See that. If you are able to give any explanation, I don't use the word disclosure here because the disclosure is the word used by management. So I use the word explanation for the auditor. See if there is a scope for you to give an additional explanation in the audit report. And if you believe the additional explanation will take care, amazing. But if the additional explanation doesn't, then you need to be very concerned because people might misunderstand your report. So then, now is the option for you. Why? See, when you tell people that you have followed the standards and then you don't follow, that's where the problem is, right? So do not mention anywhere in the audit report that you have conducted the audit in accordance with standards. That could be a very possible solution. Do not mention about standards anywhere in the audit report because you have conducted the audit in accordance with law and not in accordance with standards. Get that? Or, or if you figure out that at this point in time it is not worthy to continue the audit because at any given point of time people might still misunderstand the report that you give, I think it's the only option left out at this point in time is to withdraw from the audit engagement. So what's the last point talked about? So if there are conflicts between FR standards and law, you got to see, follow whichever it is and give an additional disclosure not to account it worth it. If an additional disclosure is required and the management has not given, then the auditor can modify the audit report. Where in case where standards and auditing are supplemented by law regulation, the auditor shall give an additional explanation in the audit report to see if it mitigates the possibility of misunderstanding. If it does so, good. If it's not, then don't mention anywhere in the audit report that we have you know, given uh, or conducted the audit accordance with standards. And finally, right, when you are clear about this that it is not going to work on, you can withdraw from the engagement and see if you have a legal or professional responsibility to inform management, TCWG or any regulatory authorities. That's it. That's what we have in standard number 210. It's a very simple standard. I do understand it's a little elaborative, but these are the only five points in the standard. To quickly sum up, I'm getting up all the five points. So what are the five points that we discussed? Three conditions to the audit. Two, the contents of the engagement letter. Three is the recurring audit. Four is about changes in terms of audit engagement. And five, additional considerations to this engagement. All right, I hope this video was very informative for you to understand what standard number 210 was. I will see you soon with another standard. Thank you. This is Harish Krishnan from Hyderabad.